please welcome CEO, Amazon Web Services, Adam Salipsky. Hello and welcome to Reinforce. I'm Adam Salipsky, CEO of Amazon Web Services. I'd like to personally welcome all of you. Today is an opportunity for in-depth learning designed to help you meet your security, identity, and compliance needs, and I'm really glad you could join us. We started Reinforce in 2019 and are thrilled to be back hosting this year. Obviously, we wish we could be together in person, but it's still great to gather virtually, and we're still really, really excited, grateful you could join, and really looking forward to fantastic uh, interactive time together. We are passionate about security at AWS, and it's my hope that you come away from this experience having learned something that makes you and your environment more secure. At AWS, security is always our number one priority. For us, really, it's actually called job zero. Nothing is more important. If the right security isn't in place for our customers, we don't have an experience that works. We don't have a business. This work could not be more fundamental or more mission critical. With AWS, you can build on the most secure global infrastructure, knowing you always own your data including the ability to encrypt it, move it, and manage retention. All data flowing across the AWS global network that interconnects to our data centers and our regions is automatically encrypted before it leaves our secured facilities. We provide the broadest and the deepest security features and capabilities, and security continues to be a top area of investment for us because that's how critical it is both for our customers and for us. We work on security solutions across many industries with just an amazing array of customers, including Edmonds, Experian, Infor, NASDAQ, Neiman Marcus, Siemens, Philips, Autodesk, Maryland Department of Human Services, Snap, and Swiss Post. You are also going to hear from Brian Lozada, Chief Information Security Officer for HBO Max. Uh, very talked about in the news, uh, uh, customer obviously at the moment, on their desire to create a friction-free user experience and how their cloud journey with AWS has led to greater automation and the ability to scale globally. During today, you'll have the opportunity to hear from AWS leaders across our security organization. And they're gonna share the latest best practices and trends and provide you with their insight into tactics and strategies that will help keep your systems and your tools protected. AWS is working as hard as we can to innovate quickly on security, but we still have a lot of invention in front of us. So please don't hesitate to tell us what we can do to help you or your business and where we need to go next. I wanna thank all of you for making the time to be part of Reinforce this year. We hope that you learn and explore what can make you and your company more secure. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the day, and thanks again for joining us. Now, please join me in welcoming our Chief Information Security Officer, Steve Schmidt. Please welcome Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer, Amazon Web Services, Steve Schmidt. Good morning, everyone. And as Adam said, welcome to our admittedly abbreviated virtual version of Reinforce 2021. We're so appreciative that you've chosen to give us a bit of your time today. I think investing your attention on a topic like cloud security has really made more sense than it does in the moment we currently find ourselves. We're in a place where this ability to connect virtually, to work online, and quickly process and store information in a safe and secure manner is of paramount importance. Many of the systems and tools that we've taken for granted in the pandemic might not have worked out so well as recently as five years ago. But the work that's been done to improve cloud security has been incredible. That's why I'm still optimistic, and I think it's day one for us with AWS Security. All right, let's get started. First off, a big thank you to our Diamond Level sponsors today, CrowdStrike, Palo Alto, Splunk, and Trend Micro. Our large and diverse group of partners are what enable us to reach customers where they are with their cloud migration or even all-in strategies. The AWS Partner Network and our AWS Managed Security Services partners are doing excellent work to keep customers secure. So thanks again to them. We'll have a bit more news from them later on in the presentation. This is our agenda to, uh, order today. 
Each section will have some updates, some best practices, some paths to avoid, and we'll have a guest drop in virtually as well. Now, we'll start off with threat detection and incident response. I know it's a big topic for our customers, so we'll dive right into it to start. Uh, from there, we'll consider identity and access management, followed by network and infrastructure security, then on to data protection and privacy, and finally, we'll end with a look at governance, risk, and compliance. Now, you may have come to this broadcast as a specialist in one of these areas, in which case I hope we give you an interesting takeaway in the other categories that you may not be as familiar with. First off, threat detection and incident response. Now then, if you've seen my presentations before, you'll know that I like to frame up each section with a quote of some sort. And this one, I think, is certainly evocative. The quote comes from Warren Buffett, and it's a, a take on his investment strategies. But I think it has relevance to our space as well, because the risk and fear in any activity comes from an overall lack of awareness, doesn't it? I'm going to continually ask you today to define what it is you're trying to protect. A knowledge gap is what causes anxiety. For our poor guy falling on screen here, maybe not knowing what the weather conditions are, or heck, not knowing how to surf well enough given the wave size, or, or what caused the real problem. For you, it could be not knowing if the underlying details have changed, or if you've got the right tools for the job. Risk is introduced from failing to define, learn, and iterate. And that's really what great threat detection and incident response is based on, the ability to know your normal good state and react to anomalies quickly. Ideally, of course, your response is happening well before you're aware of the problem, which we'll break down here momentarily. All right, so when we're considering threat detection and incident response, what's changed over the past 18 months? Uh, clearly, this is not a difficult question to answer because we've all faced profound changes in the way that we work and live during COVID times. Maybe we're used to uh, getting together in physical spaces or sharing a coffee once a week with a peer, and now we've gone completely virtual. Your meetings may all have been pushed online. Work has pulled more and more into personal devices the longer we've seen the work from home situation stretch on. It's also become really difficult to segment your workday activities by certain hours because in a remote world, schedules shift around more fluidly. It could be childcare concerns have shifted work hours around or maybe it's just the new normal when you're handling the most of your daily tasks in one physical place as opposed to having a clear line of demarcation around these are work hours and now I'm going home. And by the way, this is one thing that I think everybody should very consciously examine. Do you have the right demarcation between your work life and your personal life? That demarcation is important to your health as an individual and your effectiveness as a security professional. The numbers bear these trends out. Uh, published surveys indicate a 114% increase in remote workers, coupled with a 59% increase in bring your own device policy adoption. And this has put security teams into places they may not be entirely comfortable operating in. Uh, this is a concern that went from a sort of a nice to have kind of situation to priority number one in a matter of weeks. So as we think about threat detection and incident response and what kind of tooling becomes more critical as employees interact across disparate user interfaces on an ever-growing list of third-party applications. Adversaries have certainly noticed this paradigm shift and are attempting to exploit the vulnerabilities that go along with it. As Verizon indicated in one of their studies recently, uh, mobile phishing attempts have increased by 364% in 2020 year over year. We are on our phones almost around the clock these days. And it's quickly become apparent that the quickest way to a corporate network might be through a well-intentioned human being making a critical mistake and clicking on a link that they shouldn't have. I think it's an important point to remember. People often look at security as a technical problem. It is not. It is a human problem. It's one where you have human adversaries who exploit human weaknesses to get access to the products of humans in form of data. Now, in the sort of pseudo funny space, uh, one of my folks recently received this text to his personal device. We blurred out the URL to be uh, extra cautious here, but let's just say the URL had some clues too that this wasn't a legit text. You'll note the overt threat here. Your Amazon account will be disabled and the call to action to click on the phishing link. And, and really, this is posing as security guidance, isn't it? Click here, we'll recover your account for you. Uh, now, of course, with good training and hygiene, none of your employees should be clicking this link. But someone out there is, or else these types of really low sophistication methods wouldn't even be attempted. In a security conscious environment, your staff should see only red flags here. 
who is cutting off my access? Is this normal behavior? Why have I never seen this phone number before? Is there someone I should ask about this before making this decision? That piece is key. Do they know who to go to and say, huh, this doesn't look right? Have I been trained in how mobile phishing works? Because right now, many of the world's mistakes are coming from unforced errors. This is not supervillain activity or ninjas scaling down from rooftops. This is basic errors. If we can cut down on flat-out human mistakes, we'll be more than halfway to a more secure world. I'll be mentioning something that we call security guardians or security champions later on in the presentation that I think may get at portions of this issue because this is really about training, education, and security advocacy. Now, let's look at a few of the updates that we've released on threat detection and incident response that will hopefully provide some easy wins for your security program. As Adam mentioned, we're always looking for ways to iterate and to improve our services and features. The first update I wanted to make mention of is around a service that I continue to be really excited about, Amazon Guard Duty. For the past few years, I've come out and told you you're just one click away from the type of threat telemetry that can only be built by a security provider with access to billions and billions of distinct actions. If your core competency as a business is mid-century modern furniture design, why would you be trying to replicate a service like this in-house? This is a tool where we're ingesting not only our security information, but our partners as well. Names you've definitely heard of, such as IBM, FireEye, Sophos, Proofpoint, and CrowdStrike. We've gathered security intelligence and the partner threat feeds from around the clock and around the world but we're always looking to add new partners into our AWS partner network. And of course, there are additional partners that'd be thrilled to help you operationalize any part of this workflow as well, from alerting to ticketing and back again. And the point I keep making here is this is really a math equation. The more data that you have access to for security, or maybe should I say the more data that you can reasonably evaluate and consume in a timely manner, the better your detection percentages are going to be. The more data you have, both in terms of raw numbers and process power, the better off you're going to be. The analogy here is if you're in a ship at sea, you don't want to be responsible for predicting the weather as well. That is a specialty task that you want to have serious analytics and number crunching behind. You want predictions and forecasts and best and worst case scenarios. You don't want to be 100 miles out to sea and squinting at the horizon and wondering, is there a storm coming? You want professionals behind it doing the work to help you out. Which brings me to some of the newer and emerging capabilities of Amazon Guard Duty paired with machine learning. Now, of course, machine learning is one of those marketing terms that you'll hear thrown out as shorthand for really techy and complicated and whiz bang. Uh, it's kind of like, oh yeah, this is machine learning, so you should trust us that it's impressive. Uh, but in the case of Guard Duty, it's actually pretty simple to define and understand. What we're talking about here is things like domain reputation models based on behavioral characteristics. That's one of the ML elements that goes into Guard Duty alerting. This matters in a real-world scenario when one of your EC2 instances starts communicating with a domain that's predicted to be malicious because you will see an alert. This is where we can use the power of scale to deliver better security results. Based on all the domains that we are aware of, we can build intelligent models that can very clearly see, well, this domain is not acting like the rest of our nice normal domain crowd. And you get an alert, so then your high-judgment humans can take a look. Now, maybe there's a good reason why this net new domain is interacting with your EC2 instance. Maybe everything's completely safe and you'll note it as such, and then our model gets one more data point for the next time around. The model improves with additional data points, and the models being leveraged are looking at the things that you would logically expect. Domain popularity and history or association with known crypto mining IPs and things like that. You know, what does this mean in the real world? It means that because of the ML work that Guard Duty has in place, that we, our customers will see a four to six week head start in protecting themselves against certain activities when compared to th traditional threat intelligence platforms. There's no new action to turn these additions on to our threat library. There's no additional cost. We report to you on anomalous behavior, let you make the call from there. Then we get to AWS Security Hub. We are regularly looking around corners to find standards and practices that we can bake into templates and control frameworks for you. To get completely into the weeds here, uh, there's a control for PCI that states, 
protect audit trail files from unauthorized modifications. And by the way, that's uh, PCI DSS control 10.5.2. Uh, if you'd like to check my math here. Um, this is a requirement that is reasonable and clear. You can't have someone editing your logs after the fact. This really does make kind of perfect sense, given there's um, some sort of issue you want to be able to know when and how it happened. Plus, you can integrate Security Hub with guard duty findings and send them over to Amazon Detective to get a forensic drill down on potential vulnerabilities. You'll often hear a refrain from security practitioners around that sounds something like, uh, hey, we just want this tool to work right out of the box. Give me something that helps me with uh, security with just a few clicks. Well, Security Hub works across services automatically. It is a single UI that aggregates, organizes, and prioritizes your security alerts from a bunch of different AWS services, including Amazon Guard Duty, Amazon EC2, Security Groups, Amazon Macy, AWS Firewall Manager, Amazon Redshift, AWS Config, IAM Analyzer, as well as from about 50 different AWS partner network solutions. Now that is a lot of security benefit for very minimal effort because AWS Security Hub can be started with a single click in the AWS Management Console. And then setting Security Hub to automatically enable new controls is just one additional click. Then these controls are enabled by default going forward. Right now, you can have 159 security controls running at this moment automatically with a couple of clicks. That's the sort of reach that you want with your threat detection and incident response systems. All right. So my favorite part of these talks is always sort of what are the things that you can do today? What are the things you can take home and, and action, um, both tactically and strategically? Well, first off, don't plan your security program around competing with bad actors in real time. I urge you, don't do that. Because in the time it takes you to determine you have an issue, figure out who should be involved, and begin your process of figuring out what's broken, that's a pretty lengthy period where you are not stopping the bad guy. You're not stopping the exploits. You do not want an airbag in a car to deploy after a crash when the car is safe. You want the airbag to deploy during the accident itself. And your computer security processes should be no different. Which means turning on Amazon Guard Duty to start here and now. Reduce your remediation and recovery time and put yourself on the path to automated remediation by tying in Amazon CloudWatch events and AWS Lambda. Meaning the chain goes something more like this. Something happens. Guard duty detects and alerts on it. Auto remediation using Lambda occurs. Then you start your what happened here meetings. All of your AWS user and API activity, your S3 data events, your network traffic data through Amazon VPC flow logs, all of this can operate under a much more comfortable blanket of auto remediation. <clears throat> a real life example here would be an outbound communication to a known malicious IP address that gets noted and logged and shut down automatically the results delivered to you on a silver plated security platter. Next up is to drive to root cause. The human uh, attention span and analysis process is really kind of amazing at noticing small discrepancies. The problem is we may not always act on them the way that we need to. An easy real life example of you're running a, f a small business, maybe um, my favorite Philly cheesesteak place, and you get an alert that a new admin user has been created in one of your accounts. Uh, you track it down and it turns out it's a new payroll person who's been hired and some of their tools require additional accesses because they have permissions to information that's protected, things like date of birth or physical address and so on. The person that onboarded them just made them an admin so they didn't have to deal with permissions. But that is not what we want. We don't want an admin permission level getting thrown around as the new way people onboard. At some point, that payroll person is going to bring on a new manager. And that person is going to be made an admin as well. That is how security slippage and normalization of deviance happens. Fast forward to a year later. You now have a situation where you have no idea who is doing what in your systems. What's the solution here? More granular permissions. Your new payroll person is an admin. They have certain tools that they need, but for instance, they can't add new software to your environment or create other new admins. To bring the lesson home, 
don't hear something go bump in the night and shrug. That is not the path forward that we want to be on. If your EC2 instances are communicating with malicious IPs, you shut that traffic down automatically. But you go behind afterwards and figure out the why, because it may be indicative of a larger problem that you haven't yet solved. And where can we find the underlying causes? Our old pal Security Hub here. Uh, for alert management, Security Hub already uses two mechanisms to high, uh, help prioritize findings for you, insights and security standards. Insights are correlated findings that help you identify higher priority items faster. Examples of insights are things like S3 buckets with public write or read permissions. You can also create and customize your own insight tailored to your specific security and compliance needs. Blocking suspicious IP addresses and AWS users and accounts are supported right out of the box. So when you're starting any after-action incident report, we have many ways to get at that data. Start with Security Hub, Amazon Detective, and our logging services. These are all ways that you can drive to root cause to fix issues once, not multiple times, and then trust your alerts every single time out that you see them because you've tuned them to be accurate for your particular scenario. Do not be the ironic use case of the person turning off the alert each time who says, oh yeah, it just does that, we'll always ignore it. I guarantee you, you'll miss something important if you do. Ransomware, yeah, this is a big topic right now. Um, it gets headlines routinely, it gets at many of the detection and response themes that we've been talking about. What's interesting about this topic is it's not new in terms of presenting us with some magical new type of vulnerabilities. Um, an exploit in your system or a failure in your human processes is still an issue no matter what happens afterwards. If you have a malicious insider with the wrong access levels throughout technology history, they could do a lot of damage to you. What's new here is the idea that whomever is infiltrating doesn't actually even need to have access to the data itself to cause harm. Let's say you've got a, a great data protection plan, super crisp and well thought out. Encryption everywhere it needs to be, segregated key management so one identity can't get at the other identity's keys. Uh, critical intellectual property is stored in a manner that takes multiple users to access, the works. Well, the person on the other end of the line holding your system hostage doesn't care about any of that because they precluded you from operating your business. They aren't necessarily even threatening your business with, we'll sell these credit cards on the dark web. What they're saying is, hey, if you pay us, you get your access back and can operate again. Until then, you can't. Uh, businesses are more willing to pay this type of ransom because they're losing money for every second they are down, which makes this new in the sense that it leans more heavily on business resiliency methods. You do have a system that, if hijacked, you can get back to known good rapidly, right? And so, our guidance for ransomware, which actually dovetails pretty nicely with traditional remedies, is overall prevention is far, far better than having to deal with it in real time. Uh, if you want to dive really deeply into prevention ideas around this topic, you can ref reference something like uh, NIST 1825, which is going to go much deeper into asset management and policies and logging and backups and block listing and so on. But what I want to get into right now is some easy stuff that's on your to-do list for right now. The basic stuff like separation of duties. If no one user has the right to lock you out of all of your systems, it's gonna to be tougher for the ransomware actor to get to that point. Your operational accounts and backup accounts should be owned by different identities. That is just security hygiene, and please don't save the authentication credentials for those identities in the same place. There are publicly available self-assessment toolkits for AWS, which will run you through the checks that look for public access enablement or IAM roles that haven't been used in a few months or, or EBS volumes where you don't have a snapshot saved. You can use a tool like S3 Object Lock to make sure that someone can't exfiltrate your data, delete your copy, and then charge you to get it back. With S3 versioning feature, you can preserve, retrieve, and restore every version of an object stored in your buckets meaning recovery from both unintended user actions, because let's face it, your administrators occasionally say oops and make a mistake, and application failures is a smaller lift. With just a bit of rigor, you've got an environment where folks can't delete, where you can restore from backup easily, and where your backup has the ability to start your business up again quickly. 
I also want to mention Cloud Endure Disaster Recovery. This is a service that continuously replicates your operating system, the system configuration state, your databases, applications, and files into a low-cost staging area in your target AWS account. Uh, it's in your preferred region as well, by the way, so you maintain that sort of data sovereignty perimeter that you require. Now, of course, we hope it never happens, but in a true disaster scenario, you can have Cloud Endure automatically launch thousands of your machines in their fully provisioned state within minutes. That's the type of backup that allows you to tell your boss or the board of directors that you have to report to you've got it under control, even in stressful situations. And speaking of backups, AWS Backup Audit Manager is launching with general availability today. This is a great way to provide yourself with additional protections against your data being held ransom. This is also meant to massively simplify data governance management of your backups because Audit Manager automatically tracks your backup activities and detects when you drift from defined parameters, enabling you to take quick corrective actions. And this kind of concept really rolls up as well. Uh, if the resource is evaluated by a, a backup Audit Manager controller compliant, it reports as such. Similarly, if all the controls in a framework are compliant, then you're provided with that assurance and reporting as well. Now, I'd also encourage you, once you've got a comprehensive backup plan, to test it. Run a game day. See if you are able to restore and validate that backup is working precisely how you want it. Do not let an incident be the first time you were taking a look at this type of tooling. Making backups is a great first step. But have a run book around regular testing of recovery as well. My guess here is that we are headed towards a future where the validation of the backup and recovery process is implicitly regulated. And we could quite well see cyber insurers require this level of rigor shortly thereafter. All right, let's talk about identity and access management. IAM is such a critical aspect of a security strategy because it's the basis for everything. Our quote here highlights the critical components of good IAM policy and execution. It is action. In a meeting, um, everyone is going to say, well, of course, we should have fine-grained permissions and least privilege. That's a nice conversation topic because the correct way is usually so clear and so obvious. But then real life is going to intercede. You are going to get busy. You're going to think about cutting a few corners, and you're going to end up with a less effective IAM program as a result. And we really, really don't want that. As we consider IAM, know that it's still a place where you can pick up huge security wins right now. Today's action can pay immediate dividends. Uh, the reason the potential wins here are so prevalent is the thing we talked about back at the start of this keynote, this muddling of work and home resources. Uh, here are some stats that should give you enough data points to see how important this topic is. Four out of every five security incidents occur to, due to weak credentials. A third of employees are sharing their work materials via personal email providers. Another third have the exact same password across all of their devices, allowing for one-stop shopping for adversaries. Now, if a password for, say, I don't know, your hotel loyalty card gets leaked, but that's also the password used for your corporate resources, that takes the concern level from minimal to massive very quickly. Plus, almost half of employees are using their personal devices for work pr uh, purposes, whether it's calendaring or, or chat or email. There's an additional stat that's not on here that 42% of employers haven't secured their remote employees' personal devices. Broad access to sensitive items, that is a recipe for a bad day, whether it's in the cloud or on-premises or anywhere else. Uh, with a permissive identity and access policy, you've created the environment a bad actor needs to be successful because they can easily find a personal password that you use for a website that may not even be around anymore and try that out against your corporate resources. Gain access, use that access, assume an identity, and then look around for valuable information. There are always multiple failure points in any accident. It takes many things falling over to get to the point where you're having tense meetings with your team. Don't let access and identity be one of those things. Now, we're going to give you some quick tips that you can do today at the end of this section. These are a few of the key concepts that our IAM team regularly mentions. First off, this is free. Now, free is a solid price point, right? This goes back to what our CEO, Adam, said at the opening. Nothing is more important than security to us. 
And that's reflecting the fact that we don't want to be confused with a revenue generator here. This is table stakes. This is something I tell my people every single day. We have to get this right for customers. We have to give them the tools that are required for them to properly secure the things that are important to them. That may be everything in the case of a large multinational bank, or it may just be email and mailing addresses for a small business. Either way, making things easier is what we have to aim for every day. With IAM, right from the start, you can do things like setting work hours. No one can log in at 2 a.m. from Australia to your business in Des Moines, Iowa. You can restrict services as well. You can require multi-factor authentication, meaning I not only need this password that I've remembered, but I need this physical hardware device to be able to log into a, a particular application or set of infrastructure components. And if someone steals one of my people's laptops, I want them to get to have to go past two different access control systems at least in order to get access to anything that's interesting. That slows down the adversary's progress and gives us as defenders more time to react. Credentialing contractors for a certain period is a feature and uh, doing that work right up front at hire so I'm not scrambling around wondering if anyone is left at the company holds a grudge. That kind of thing is where you need to build the right muscle memory by repeatable processes and building your identity and access management frameworks to last for the long run. By the way, all of this works within the framework of existing identity systems such as Microsoft Active Directory. Again, we're looking to do the right thing for customers here to help you stay secure regardless of what tooling you choose to use. All right, a few updates to our IAM features to consider. And uh, by the way, Karen Habercorn will have a, a more in-depth IAM review during her leadership session, Building for the Future with AWS Identity Services later on today. This update allows for policy validation through IAM Access Analyzer. It's been called a, a game changer by customers. A real use case here might be IAM Access Analyzer sending a security alert when a policy grants access for a role for all services. Uh, plus, that security warning will include a recommendation you scope down the permissions. Another example might be the validation of policies that specify your tagging conditions. Uh, this is a place where IAM tooling can tie directly into your risk program. You're able to show definitively that you've taken tangible steps to drive down risk. Now, under the hood, of course, IAM Access Analyzer is automatically performing these checks as you're authoring your identity policies using the JSON policy editor and the IAM console. I'd encourage you to take a look at this feature as part of your larger IAM program. Now, what can you do today? What are the takeaways from this particular activity? First up, put on your calendar to review permissions on a regular cadence. Monthly, quarterly, you decide, but have a regular idea of who needs access to what and revalidate it on a periodic um, schedule. Now, of course, the better thing to do really is to automate this process where you prompt your managers to say, do these people still need access? Yes or no, if not revoke that access. And if you pull a report that says this user type hasn't accessed the system in 60 days, remove that set of permissions. If an employee doesn't need access to something, why are you expanding your risk profile? This is a place to consider how the work is evolving too. Maybe now credit card numbers are being accepted by your business and you need an entirely new permissions group to handle that. Uh, don't have a security program where you are bolting on permissions as the business grows, thinking, well, this is close enough to what they do. No, no, no. If your business is changing, if you're heading to a new country or a new vertical, that's awesome. You're opening up for new streams of revenue. With that, though, comes reevaluating your security needs each and every time. This should be put on a regular schedule so that it becomes a normal behavior. This will lead to your employee base being more curious and aware on their own, too. And next time a new line of business is opening, your partners and operations are going to approach you in the security team prior to launching something. You're going to get closer to the inception of all the areas that need foundational security if you show that you're a diligent partner throughout that process. And finally, within that plan, be granular. Don't just take everything your business does and throw it into an ops bucket and call it good. That is the, the easy way out and is probably the wrong thing to do. You never want security to be a department of no, so ideally set this up correctly from the beginning. You as a security practitioner want to have people banging on your door saying, hey, 
I need this access to do my job? No, that isn't the best use case. It's not the best use of your time, and it's not the best user experience. But that is a lot better than, oh, wait, Jenny had access to what database and what credentials were taken? So build the framework, make it easy to use, audit it regularly, confine user access to that, which is just what's needed. Now, speaking about user friction, if someone is opening a ticket or paying security that they can't do their job because of permissions, that is a problem you need to fix. But fix it once. You've got a user that likely should be a part of a larger group that does things, and now you've remediated for all of the users within that group of permissions as well. But we all have activities that we do all day that form the sort of texture of our work. I personally don't want access to things that I don't need access to. I want to be located as far away from sensitive information that doesn't involve my actual job. Uh, you've heard me say this before. Keep humans away from data. A subclause of that could be, and only give the access that each human needs for only as long as they need it. That mantra will go a long way towards making you and your company more secure. All right, network and infrastructure security. This is clearly a biggie where cloud is concerned because large portions of this are controls that we can set up for you on our side of the shared responsibility model, and you don't have to deal with the heavy lifting associated with it. Here's Amazon CEO Andy Jassy's quote on the beginning of AWS. Uh, this was the sort of initial crux of what we were trying to do to, to cut a bunch of repetitive processes out and get right to the part where our people could start building safely and quickly. A uh, slight historical side, by the way. When I joined Amazon, it was to help set up a service that became known as Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, or VPC. And after we delivered VPC, Andy asked me to help build a security team for the company, precisely because we were service builders and owners first. We wanted to remove the hassles for all of our service builders. <laughs> we want to handle the items that are a hassle for your business as well. You shouldn't want to build a data center if we are doing our job properly. And we never want security to get in the way of running your core business. The spirit of AWS is one of customer obsession, making security easy for you. There are certain aspects of the equation we should be better equipped to handle given our expertise. One of them is supply chain. We have decades of logistical experience in getting things safely and securely from one place to the next. We have decades of experience in sourcing from suppliers who have been vetted, audited, and verified. You can see on screen here, there's a, a trend of elevated risk among certain supply chains and suppliers. And uh, truly, there's not enough human judgment to cover the expanding risk profile across the industry. As we've seen in recent headlines, if an adversary can get into your supply chain, they can potentially operate in a manner that's going to weaken your overall security. Now, clearly, you should still have checks that identify the risk to your business throughout its particular life cycle. But we're proud of our efforts here. We're proud to say we attest to a level of supply chain controls that allow you to operate with confidence in the cloud, knowing that the broad set of materials that make up our cloud have been thoughtfully considered and checked throughout each step of our boot process. Because our goal here is to make the teeter-totter longer, to give you leverage taking more responsibility when we're able. We've made inroads down the supply chain so that we own more of the process, and the results are surfaced in the end products that you see. In this particular paradigm, the heavy lifting and supplies of building things work that's best left to us. You fire up an instance and know that wherever in the world that command is going, it's residing in a data center with security controls that are backed up by 24-7, 365 audit attestations. We handle the physical security of our data centers, who has access to what, and each machine is built and operated to our exacting specifications. This removes a portion of risk for your portfolio because you get access to the tools without having to go out and set up dozens of trusted relationships. In the same manner, we want to make security easier for you, the end user. We want you to leverage our cloud, secure in the knowledge that all the components have been considered from a security perspective. This type of thinking has been called providing a friction-free user experience. And for more on this concept of friction-free, I want to bring a customer of ours, the CISO of HBO Max, Brian Lozada, joining us virtually. Brian? Thank you, Steve. Appreciate the opportunity to come here and share the HBO Max story, a story of who we are, what we're doing, and where we're going. 
18 months ago, I was given this amazing opportunity to come join the HBO Max team and be part of this journey, a journey of building a new streaming experience. One that's not just about delivering the content that we all enjoy, but about redefining what a streaming experience could be. HBO Max is WarnerMedia's direct-to-consumer platform, offering best-in-class quality entertainment. We launched our platform in May of 2020, and we recently began our global rollout with launching in 39 markets across Latin America and the Caribbean. Globally, HBO and HBO Max has over 67 million customers, and we haven't even scratched the surface of our potential. The HBO Max security team was excited to help tell the HBO Max story. We were also eager to build. Not just build an architecture that facilitates our global scale, but build a security culture that helps drive innovation. The one thing the HBO Max security team never wanted to be accused of was lacking imagination. Our mission as a team was to establish a customer-driven security culture that enables our growing business while securing the customer experience. Understanding our business partners and their challenges was the first step in establishing that customer-driven security culture as our development and product organizations are at the ground level solving those customer problems. And we recognize that and welcome the opportunity to support them. Creativity plays a large role in problem solving. And at times, fear gets in the way of that creativity, truly impacting what's possible. The HBO Max security team did not want to bring controls or limitations to the problem solving process. We wanted to help deliver solutions. As part of establishing that customer-driven security culture, the team wanted to help break down those fears that consistently slow down innovation, whether that's fear of a security risk, fear of a misconfiguration, fear of the unknown. As security practitioners, we wanted to help our business overcome those fears, as fear does not get to dictate our tempo. Our customers do. Our development and product organizations are our customers as well. Their creativity and problem solving is what allows HBO Max to deliver on a seamless customer experience. Creating a friction-free experience for security to be applied in our environment was paramount. We felt the more we enable our development and product organizations, the more they will be able to innovate on behalf of our customers. The HBO Max security team embodied extreme ownership of securing the customer experience by collaborating across the organization to understand where we could help remove security friction in the development lifecycle to enable risk-taking. Risk-taking is necessary while innovating. Those who do not take risk will always be chasing those that do. And at HBO Max, we wanna be on the cutting edge of innovation, and that requires taking risk. Our approach to accomplish this shift in security culture was to build an event-driven architecture with visibility and guardrails, not controls or limitations. The HBO Max security team leveraged AWS's cloud adoption framework to formulate our build plan with security epics around identity and access management, data protection, incident response, resilience, secure CICD, just to name a few. An event-driven architecture helps us facilitate the developer experience, focus on detection, and enable automatic remediation. How are we doing this? The main components of our architecture are broken into two focus areas detection, and remediation. This approach allows us to create the right guardrails for our development and product organizations while providing necessary response if necessary, thereby building confidence in the innovative and problem-solving process. The detection portion of our architecture leverages services like CloudTrail to source real-time events as resources are being built or actioned on. That could be anything from overly permissive security groups to network and port changes. We also leverage guard duty across our VPCs to ingest a variety of logs, such as CloudTrail logs, VPC flow logs, and DNS logs to detect possible malicious events. Those events, in conjunction with our Amazon Inspector and AWS Config events, are fed into Security Hub, which we use as our central dashboard for security findings for all of our AWS security services. EventBridge is a core component to our event-driven architecture, as this allows us to automatically connect our detection and remediation capabilities. EventBridge helps us drive remediation by delivering a stream of real-time data from events to our custom security lambdas for both prevention and remediation. This offers us a cost-effective way of automating security in a multi-region, multi-account environment. To drive those lambdas, we are using Cloud Custodian, an open source tool that helps us improve on our security development velocity. 
our security engineers can build a simple YAML file for detection, remediation, and notification actions via Slack, which Cloud Custodian then converts into Lambdas. This architecture pushes more automation across our environment. We should not be fixing the same problem twice. It's not effective or efficient with our resources. Everyone here is an automation away from updating their resume, and that's a good thing. We need to embrace that. We believe that responding to risk with automation is necessary in today's digital world. If we are not responding at the speed of a tweet, we're not responding quick enough for our customers. Now that we've enabled this architecture, the HBO Max security team is focused on expanding our security out of the box adoption by making security free to consume for our development and product organizations. This helps us scale security without slowing us down, allowing us to maintain our agility. It also helps in reducing the blast radius by providing boundary awareness with automation. And finally, it helps us enable our business by automatically having security built in to the AWS services our development and product organizations are using to solve customer problems. This makes security easy to consume, where anyone can click, innovate, and drive change quickly. What have we learned? Building an ever-changing event-driven architecture is not easy. It's hard, but anything worth doing is on the other side of hard. Committing to failing fast is a mentality. And if security is willing to fail fast, everyone should consider it. Many times failure is part of the journey. We should embrace the growth that comes with failing fast, but more importantly, recognize that we are failing forward. So what's next for HBO Max? We are excited to announce that we're continuing our global expansion with launches in certain countries in the EU in the fall, and we want your help in doing so. We have over 100 open roles within HBO Max across multiple disciplines. If you want to be challenged and be given the opportunity to be creative in problem solving, come put your mark on building a new streaming experience and join us. With that, I leave you with this video on what it's like to be part of building a new streaming experience at HBO Max. Thank you for your time. People are starting to notice. for this incredible recognition. Thank you so much. Wow. I told you, man. I'm impressed, Morty. Welcome to CNN Special Coverage. All right. All right. Okay. We should do uh, it. Yeah. Really happening. Great stuff, Brian. And I know as a watcher of Mayor of Easttown that I'm going to take his word for it that his team is not uh, keeping tabs on my recent binge-watching sessions here. So we're going to move on to some updates now, as well as best practices around your network and infrastructure security plan. A term that you'll often hear a lot about is confidential computing. But what we're really talking about here, let's define it. The most basic definition is isolation technology in processing sensitive data. Our way of doing this at AWS is with Nitro Enclaves. Nitro Enclaves often offer a hardened and highly constrained environment to isolate security critical applications. Now, customers already use Amazon EC2 to process a wide variety of highly sensitive data, such as personally identifiable information, and they protect this data with access controls and with encryption both at rest and in transit. But when this data needs to be decrypted for processing, 
customers might be setting up a wide array of VPCs to do that work in. This can be a significant effort, and it leads to a potential path where shortcuts get taken. We wanted to make it easier to set up and manage isolated compute environments in EC2 that not only protect your information against outside adversaries, but also protect your data from your own staff. In terms of the what around confidential computing, enclaves are separate virtual machines. They have no persistent storage, no interactive access, and no external networking. So even if you're a root user or an admin user on the instance, you will not be able to SSH into the enclave or otherwise access it. Which means with Nitro enclaves, you're able to isolate the processing of highly sensitive data within your EC2 instances, including from your own people. Nitro Enclaves has attestation that allows you to verify that only authorized code is running in your enclaves and includes AWS key management service integration where KMS is able to read and verify these attestation documents so that only your enclaves can access your sensitive material. Another update we're excited about is the AWS IoT core integration with AWS Private Link enabling customers to create private IoT endpoints in a virtual private cloud using VPC endpoints. If you're collecting data from machines in a connected factory, but you don't want to expose the local factory network to the public internet for security reasons, which is probably a good choice, then this is the update for you. This also allows for the restriction of access to only allow connections over a VPC endpoint. When used with network to VPC connectivity, your IoT Core VPC endpoint can function as though it were hosted directly on your private network. This is a solid example of shutting down an angle that doesn't seem flashy, but we've all seen headlines recently where always on physical devices connected to the public internet had very little to no security protections in place, and as a result got abused by adversaries all over. All right. So what makes sense to look at today for your network and infrastructure security plan? First up, launch AWS resources in defined virtual networks. You have complete control over your virtual networking environment, including the selection of your own IP address ranges, the creation of subnets, the creation of routing tables and network gateways. You can use both IPv4 and IPv6 for most resources in your virtual private cloud, helping to ensure secure and easy access to resources and applications. Next up, the AWS Well-Architected Tool. This is another completely free security tool that compares your workloads to the latest architectural best practices. The tool was developed to help cloud architects build secure and resilient application infrastructure and is based on the Well-Architected Framework. This is available right now in the AWS Management Console. Just define your workload and answer a series of questions regarding operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. The AWS Well-Architected tool then provides you a plan on how to architect for the cloud using established and audited best practices. Which brings us to data protection and privacy. For global companies, there's definitely been an awakening as to how sensitive different cultures are to data privacy. I think that we're going to see that looking at this in a, in a jurisdictional sense might really miss the mark. You really need to have ways to protect customer data no matter where it resides. Customers still have plenty of valid questions out there. How long will my data be retained for? Who will you share it with? How will it be protected from someone walking out the door with it? And so on. These are concepts and areas where it's critical to get it right, no matter what business you're in. But how? This can become a very complicated topic very quickly, so it's important once again to define some of our terminology. Speaking of data protection, one of the things that we've seen recently is a trend towards zero trust architecture. A recent United States government executive order mentioned zero trust as a security model that they want agencies to develop a plan towards adopting. And right here in the EO, you can find some of the definitions which state that zero trust architecture is a set of system design principles and a coordinated cybersecurity and systems management strategy based on an acknowledgement that threats exist both inside and outside traditional network boundaries. And if you keep scanning, you'll note a bunch of familiar terms, eliminating implicit trust, continuous verification, setting up users in the manner of least privilege. 
constantly limiting access to only what is needed to do a particular job for a particular period of time. Looking for anomalous or malicious activity. Granular risk-based controls and security automation. These are not new topics, clearly. But they're definitely worth discussing within the framework of data protection because this type of model is all about keeping sensitive data secure by using multiple security layers. Now, because zero trust can mean different things in different contexts, I'd like to briefly get into the guiding principles for zero trust and the way that we think about them within AWS. Uh, the first thing to consider is always going to be your particular use case. Are you looking at adding a mobile app for your workforce to check their uh, appointments or calendars? Or maybe you're building a new portal to upload personally identifiable information. Uh, these use cases should have a direct impact on how you move forward. The next key is to avoid a false choice between identity or network controls. This is what Zero Trust is getting at. Do not trust one layer of security controls to be the end of the equation. We've known for a long time that network perimeter-based security controls are really not sufficient for anything. The best security does not come from a choice between identity-centric or network-centric controls. Network permissions provide guardrails where identity-centric controls can operate within those guardrails. They should not only coexist, they should augment each other. A great example of this is VPC endpoints. They provide the ability to attach a policy that allows you to enforce identity-centric rules at a logical network boundary. And finally, Though zero trust is an overarching concept, it is not a stamp that you can just throw on your particular technology, no matter how much marketing people try, and call it zero trust certified. And it's just sort of like cloud washing, but for uh, trust enforcement. For example, we have millions of customers securely calling AWS through a diverse set of public and private networks. There's nothing about the security of AWS API infrastructure that depends on the underlying network itself. Each one, every one, of those API requests is authenticated and authorized every single time all around the globe. Uh, I should note that the use of cloud-based APIs aren't generally mentioned within zero trust discussions, perhaps because AWS led the way with this approach to securing APIs from the very start, such that it's now assumed to be sort of a basic part of every cloud security story, even before zero trust was a fashionable term. So then, you know what you're building. Don't make either or security decisions and do get very granular with your security choices. That will help you build a robust data protection and privacy program. With that in mind, what are some of the more recent developments in this category? Well, we announced strength and contractual commitments that go beyond what's required to protect the personal data that customers entrust AWS to process. These new commitments apply to all customer data subject to GDPR processed by AWS whether it's transferred outside the European economic area or not. These commitments are automatically available to all customers using AWS to process their customer data with no additional action required uh, through a new supplementary addendum to the AWS GDPR data processing addendum. That's a mouthful. Thanks, lawyers. I appreciate it. Our strength and contractual commitments include challenging law enforcement requests where they're overly broad and disclosing only the minimum amount of customer data that's necessary to satisfy a lawful request. We're also strengthening data protection from a technology perspective. Customers are using our latest generation of EC2 instances, automatically getting the protection of the AWS Nitro system I discussed earlier. Nitro was designed to operate in the most hostile network environment we could imagine, building an encryption, a secure boot that's validated, a hardware-based boost of trust, and restrictions on operator access, whether ours or yours. Lastly, we continue to provide additional support to customers subject to GDPR. We've launched two new online resources to help customers complete data transfer assessments that are required by GDPR, the first of which is our privacy features of AWS services, as well as our sub-processor page, which contain information on third-party processing, customer-initiated support requests, and our infrastructure entities worldwide. This is information that's available publicly today. With all of this in mind, what should you do next? First off, have a plan. This seems really simple, but so many people miss this step. Know what you're storing, where it is stored, who has access to it, 
and what types of access they have for what reason. This is the place where being rigorous is an absolute must. You have to know and classify the levels of customer data you're storing, why you're storing it, for how long, and so on. And you have to keep records of this, especially if you're in a regulated industry. This could be an entirely easy exercise if you're storing limited customer information. The risk clearly rises, though, with each rung you go up the PII ladder, whether it's health information or national ID cards. These are areas where you must have definitive steps in place to classify and track information. Customer service could access this much, but human resources needs these types of permissions. Sales can maybe see phone numbers. This is a place you do not wing it, as these are business ending levels of risk at the highest levels. Plus, honestly, it's just the right thing to do for all of our customers out there. I mentioned access levels before, and, and this ties in. Think about it this way. You want your own data protected when you go to the pharmacy or when you're accessing your bank account. So treat your customers the same way that you'd want your data be, to be treated. From a moral imperative standpoint, this is a really easy call. But just make sure this is the one place you do get completely down into the weeds, no matter where you sit in the organization. One of the Amazon leadership principles is dive deep. And this is an area where it really, really does matter that you understand with precision the details of what's going on in your business. You are never going to regret having granularly defined everything sensitive that you are storing and processing. With that in mind, you can use tools like what S3 supports for free, easy encryption using AES-256 encryption standard. As I'm sure we're all aware, S3 bucket encryption at rest <coughs> is important to prevent your data from being exposed to anyone who might get physical access. This level of protection also happens to be required for certain compliance standards, such whether it's PCI DSS for credit cards, NIST 800, or encryption has to be set on default for any particular bucket. This causes all subsequent items to be saved in that S3 bucket to be encrypted automatically. So although this isn't a set and forget tool, it's a great way to streamline your data policies with just a few clicks. And speaking of encryption, we're excited to share that AWS acquired Wicker in late June. This is a company that developed end-to-end -end encrypted communication technology. With Wicker, customers and partners benefit from advanced security features not available with traditional communication services, whether it's across messaging or voice and video calling, file sharing, or collaboration. This gives security-conscious enterprises the ability to implement important security controls to help them meet their compliance requirements. Now, some of these use cases uh, here might be things like securely communicating with office-based employees or to keep communication between employees and business partners private while remaining compliant with regulatory record retention requirements. And that's a really big one when you consider encrypted communication tools. All right, so we are now arriving at the governance, risk, and compliance portion of this talk. Now, this is a topic that lends itself to passionate practitioners because no one accidentally starts learning about compliance regulations, let's face it. You either have an active interest in the security controls and frameworks that comprise the massive amounts of standards and certifications that are out there, or you don't. But I'm going to give a quick preamble here in a moment as to why this topic should interest you if you're involved with cloud security, even when it seems like something you'd prefer to leave to your auditors and regulators to short, sort out. We went with an Anna Kendrick quote here to lighten up the subject matter a little bit because it is GRC. But as she's an Academy Award nominee that loves structure, she is the perfect context setter. This is a, a very tiny sliver of compliance programs that we regularly update, but I thought it might be helpful to drill down on one in particular. Uh, the first I want to call out on GRC is the first line, services in scope for high trust. Uh, I want to break this down slightly in order to give you some feel for why these kinds of attestations are important. Uh, the first thing to note is high trust itself was built as a framework for protecting sensitive healthcare information, but it draws from standards and regulations like GDPR, the ISO series of standards, NIST, PCI, and HIPAA to create a comprehensive set of baseline security and privacy controls. Now, we as practitioners tend to want to box certifications and attestations into whatever region or industry vertical they are most relevant to, which makes a sense of what we look at our business granularity. But in this case, I wanted to note that high trust is derived from a bunch of different standards in its own right. 
GDPR or European data privacy law, maybe it's PCI for credit cards. HIPAA, of course, is a healthcare law here in the United States. The International Standards Organization, or ISO, is itself an international standard setting body, and so on. You get the concept here. Many of these standards have overlapping concepts, and many of the standards have over overlapping security controls attached to them as well. And we need to meet over 150 different controls to be high trust certified. These control sets have arranged in a manner that many of us are actually familiar with. We just may not have thought of it as compliance as such. There are seven objectives around access control with names like uh, define user roles and responsibilities. Uh, that sounds pretty familiar. It should it, because it's the primary function of IAM and having a plan for handling data. Then there's a human resources component with detailed security for the entire employee life cycle, follows by having a risk management plan, asset management, security, and physical security, and so on. I'm not going to list them all here because that would be a whole presentation on its own. But what I'm getting at is the concepts that make up these certifications, frameworks, laws, and attestations, all drill down to real security concepts that you can use. You don't need to do business in the EU to take a look at the GDPR concepts and find something of value to your organization. You don't need to process credit cards to understand that encryption and limiting who has access to sensitive data is important. I point all this out to show that all of these terms and acronyms can be distilled down to their core by looking at the regulations or frameworks themselves. This is something we do at AWS routinely. Our cloud and services are validated against thousands of security controls across geographies and industries. And it gives us a very solid insight into how security is made operational and real. What that means is you can trust that the level of rigor goes into the building and operating of each service and the auditing of each service before it appears on our services and scope webpage. We take that all on so that you can partner with us and not have to do so. For certifications such as High Trust CSF, if you're using our in-trust or in-scope services, you inherit our portion of those controls. You're responsible for implementing the controls that aren't running in our cloud, but you're starting with a significant structural advantage if you're all in on AWS. And as per normal, customers can download the latest High Trust CSF certificate now through AWS Artifact in the AWS Management Console. I'm going to take a moment to go over some of the partners that are making the business of security and compliance easier for customers, as well as a few updates of note here. First off, our Level 1 MSSP program. This is a program that's an industry first, a baseline standard of quality for managed security providers in the cloud. I asked for them to put together a quick little explainer video with a few of our partners and our own Ryan Orsi. Ryan, take it away. We created the Level 1 MSSP Competency Program to bring the best MSSPs in the world to the AWS Partner Network. The program annually enables and validates MSSPs' technical and operational capabilities meet the Level 1 Managed Security Service requirements. It's a good starting point for customers to operationalize their security responsibilities in the cloud. It spans 10 specific 24-7 security service areas each with defined technical and operational requirements by AWS security experts all around the company. Plan is AWS Level 1 MSS bundle of services. We're helping to deliver business value to our customers. Combining Clownet's experience with the AWS Level 1 MSSP competency um, gives our customers a long-term security partner they can rely on uh, and helps achieve their business goals. We expect that the MAD security Overall growth will be two and a half times faster than our traditional core offering and even stronger for cloud. Combined with our number one cyber consultancy globally will put us in a unique position as we serve our clients' cloud cyber needs. The biggest thing that Sophos wants customers to understand is that we understand the burden of managing security and that's why we want to do it for the customers. And so together with our partnerships with AWS and our partnerships with our global network of channel community, we can do that for customers. We've long held the belief that uh, security can be a tremendous enabler for success on the AWS cloud and allow for customers to really unleash its full potential. The level one MSSP competency should give you uh, faith that there are offerings out there that are tried and tested, that many have experience with and have seen success with. So you can take the plunge, fully embrace uh, getting you know, an augmentation for your own security operations and uh, unleashing the full potential of the AWS cloud. 
And here are our launch partners for the Level 1 Managed Security Services Partners Program, both for the competency and category sellers. We want this program to help you free up time to invest in your core business. Dan said it well at the tail end there. Uh, these are tried, tested, and vetted solutions. Next up are AWS security competency partners. We're very deliberate about our community of security technology and consulting partners, and they represent every aspect of cloud management, from migration to operations. Again, to become a security competency partner, you have to have been vetted across multiple security categories. Those, so these are partners who really know their space. We've asked a few of those partners, including CrowdStrike, Trend Micro, Palo Alto, and Splunk, to give us 90 seconds on this topic. We'll hear first from Jessica Alexander of CrowdStrike. Customers usually express three main challenges when they move or migrate to the cloud. Skill set, visibility, and consumption-based billing models. Well, at CrowdStrike, we've learned that our AWS security competency builds trust not only with our customers, because they know we've been validated by AWS, but it also builds trust with AWS because they know that our products align with their best practices. Cloud platforms like AWS provide incredibly powerful sets of capabilities to application owners and development teams. Yet security teams are challenged with just the scale and velocity at which new services are being adopted. Many organizations are moving to the cloud, but this increases complexity. For most, it isn't a simple lift and shift, and they have to maintain security and stay compliant throughout the migration. Uh, so across our customer base, uh, customers are at different stages in their cloud journey. So Splunk solutions help customers search, analyze, and act on data ingested into Splunk. Our security analytics solutions help customers really reduce mean time to detect new threats and streamline investigations. The AWS environment is incredibly secure, but you as a customer are responsible for securing what you put in the cloud. And that's where we focus our Cloud One security services platform on providing your builders with the tools they need to get security done quickly in their environments without slowing them down. Now, these are all of our security competency partners. And as you can see, there are plenty available to help you wherever you are with your own program. You can locate purchase, deploy, and manage these cloud-ready software solutions in a matter of minutes from the AWS marketplace. And finally, our consulting and technology partners in security engineering, governance risk and compliance, security operations, and automation. Again, no matter where you are in your program, there's someone out there who has seen it before and can assist you in getting to the next level. So what can you do today to make your program stronger with regards to governance risk and compliance? There are so many ways to learn right now. How to up-level your security program, whether you're running your own business as a sole proprietor or leading a multinational enterprise. Whether it's in the AWS security blog, our security and compliance website, or AWS Artifact that allows you to download our certifications, there are plenty of ways to learn more to make your security program even better. We have technical documentation, videos, demos, trainings, certifications, and best practices being published and updated regularly. So check back. Well, as we near the end of the presentation today, I'd also like to take a quick moment to recommend an operational program that we are seeing tangible results from internally. We all know that security can't be the only the job of your security team, and that truly maintaining a culture of good security hygiene is going to take buy-in from everyone within your business. This brings me to the concept of security guardians, or I've also seen it called security champions. Essentially, this is a group of people that sit outside the security organization, but who volunteer to help maintain certain best practices within their individual teams. Embedding security champions within your business and giving them a seat at the table as to how security and their group can work better together within the framework of the business can really provide huge value. I'd encourage you to consider starting this type of program internally, and we'll be sharing more about this program at reInvent in a few months. I'd also like to give a quick plug to our Cloud Audit Academy, which we've designed specifically for those who are in auditing, risk, and compliance roles and are involved in assessing regulated workloads in the cloud. The training we put together dives into both cloud-specific audit considerations as well as AWS best practices for security auditing generally. 
The curriculum here starts with a wide scope, which is cloud and industry agnostic, and then narrows to the, as the learner progresses to focus on AWS and industry-specific content. Of course, e-learning formats are available, and we have instructor-led training formats too. Attendees can also receive continuing professional education credits from recognized security professional associations within the industry. So if you're an auditor, regulator, or even just a security, privacy, or compliance practitioner out there looking to learn more about how the concepts around confidentiality, integrity, and availability work within auditing AWS, you'll likely find this really interesting. You can learn more at the URL here on the screen. What I'd like you all to do now is to join the conversation around security. Security professionals never function best in isolation, and a free exchange of ideas and suggestions on how to improve security is something that we all can bring value to. So please, join the conversation. If you're looking to keep the conversation going, we've got a number of Twitter handles you can engage with. This is a really easy way to stay up to date. That's all for me. We have a really great day of content coming up for you. Up next will be how AWS integrates a culture of privacy to protect and enable customers. This will be a great session from our own Jenny Brinkley, Ken Beer, and Ann Toth. We'll take a short break while we reset the stage and be right back with that session. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate your time.